commentaries in the book of Acts are some of the few to really deal with that meta narrative that deals with the three lines of Noah uh, because they're dealing with it there in chapters 8, 9, and 10. And so they go back from there, they leap back to Genesis and talking about it. As far as Old Testament commentaries, very few deal with it. My commentary on Genesis will deal with it. <laughs> it's one of the things I want to make certain I've, I've contributed and include. Uh, it's one that I've been working long and hard on to try to make certain that I get all the possible resources and sources I can in talking about the issues. Uh, if you look, if you, you might not have it with you today, but if you look at Matthews, he gives these nice little charts to us of Japheth's descendants on page 440, and then he has Ham's descendants on 444, and then he gets to Shem's descendants uh, a little bit later here, get passed over on page uh, 459. And uh, as you look at these, uh, there's a lot of issues that are skipped over by him. For example, what our next topic is, is in chapter 10, verse 25, with regard to Peleg. And if you look at the chart that he gives, he goes down here as Shem, and he has the five descendants of Shem, Elam, which is Persia, Asher, which would be Assyria, and Arphaxad, which could very well be uh, including the Chaldeans, uh, Lud, which is in North Africa, and Aram, which is part of Syria. And after Arphaxad, you have Shelah, you have Eber. Eber is the father of the line that goes all the way down to Abraham. But in his chart, you've got Joktan and all the Arabian peoples listed in a line under Joktan and Peleg listed over by himself. And it doesn't really represent a very full picture or he doesn't take time to explain why the focus on Peleg. And how does Peleg fit into this other than being Shem's descendant? That is an area that also needs to be developed. It also is evidence that in these genealogies, there are some gaps. There are missing elements. They're not presented as complete. And this is one of the issues that we have to deal with when trying to talk about the issue of do they represent all peoples on all the earth or only certain ancient Near Eastern peoples. So let's move to Peleg and the earth's division in chapter 10, verse 25. And on your study sheet here, you had one question and only one question. What are the interpretive options for ki beyamo nivlega haaretz, in whose days the earth was divided? What are some of the viewpoints or options of interpreting that, the meaning of it that you came up with in doing your study sheet? Anyone? Go ahead, Roberto. Tower of Babel. Okay, Tower of Babel, the division of languages and division of peoples. Okay. Other types of division proposed. Continental drift or Pangea. Okay, thank you, Chris. Water course Okay. Physical uh, division. And you're mentioning a second one. The idea of water courses or irrigation. Right? Okay, what are some of the others? Craig? Okay, ethnic and political or sociological division, uh, kind of setting up the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict in a sense. <laughs> Very early on, a conflict here seeming to uh, take place and notice it's within the line of Shem, just as later the descents of Abraham, Ishmael as one and later Esau. The conflict between the Arab Israeli conflict is a conflict within the line of Shem, not a conflict between Shem and Ham, which uh, raises some very interesting questions as well. Okay, what other options? Yes? Uh, the one that said that there was maybe a division of the peoples before Babel. Okay, thanks, Sam. <coughs> a division of peoples before Babel. Uh, the fact that they begin to set up loyalties, perhaps to build other cities, 
Um, there's a number of things that could be involved. Anyone find any others? David. A division caused by the ending of the ice age and the melting of the ice sheets, which would change the sea level. Okay. Uh, kind of relates to the physical aspect of continental drift, but more involved with habitable areas of the surface of the earth and perhaps the uh, raising of land bridges and then the overflowing of land bridges. Okay. Craig? Major irrigation projects. Okay, major irrigation projects. Okay. Anything else that you came up with? Chris? Okay, local earthquake. Uh, when we were in Israel, my wife was very disturbed that we kept being placed in the top floors of the hotels we were in because all day long I kept reminding people, hey, this city was destroyed by the earthquake of 363 AD, this one 419, this one 468. You know, the history of that land is filled with earthquakes from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah that is mentioned at least twice in Scripture. And, uh, it, 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 you know, one of, the, one of the most impressive ones was in 363 A.D. when the earthquake struck the area of Galilee and it caused a slope to collapse along the Jordan River Valley north of the Sea of Galilee, north of Bethsaida, and it blocked the Jordan River. And when the Jordan River finally flowed again, when the blockage was topped by the gathering waters, it then sent a wall of water and mud and debris down through the Jordan Channel all the way to the Sea of Galilee that wiped out Bethsaida. Bethsaida had been situated on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Today, it is 1.2 miles away <laughs> from it because the debris that came down wiped out the jetty and filled in the north shore of the Sea of Galilee up to two kilometers. So that now the city sits two kilometers away from the shoreline, where it, in 363 AD before the earthquake, it was sitting on the shoreline, just like Tiberius, just like Capernaum and, and uh, others. So it has profound effects, the earthquakes. And we need to remember that when we're talking about these issues that we're talking about here, we're talking about post-flood. We're talking about many peoples in the ancient Near East. We're talking about peoples that are close to the Rift Valley that comes out of Africa. And the Rift uh, is a, uh, actually a contact of two plates. And you have things occurring like what we saw here just this last week in Nepal. And the earthquake there. Uh, Huge earthquakes take place, okay? Well, you've covered almost all of them. The dividing of languages, irrigation, continental drift, earthquake, dividing the nations, a major political rift somewhere between the various peoples, uh, division into Abrahamic and Arabic lines. That was another one that was mentioned there. Those are the uh, seven major views proposed by a variety of commentators uh, with regard to what it meant that the earth was divided in the days of Peleg. Now, a good friend of mine has done some research in the background and history of migratory uh, movements of peoples in the ancient Near East. And in working on that project, he began to get some ideas about this one. That certainly somewhere in the historical records of the ancient Near East, there would be an identification of this migration of peoples at the end of the flood, after the flood by a number of years, but at the Tower of Babel and what occurred. And he believes that he has identified some of the potential aspects of that and is working on it and is going to publish a paper on it sometime in the near future. And I'm looking forward to its results. He presented a preliminary uh, draft uh, several years ago uh, at uh, the national ETS meetings. Uh, he's now on the faculty at uh, the uh, uh, Shepherd uh, Theological Seminary 
in Cary, North Carolina. And uh, I think that he's got a lot of things he's going to be presenting in that area. He's doing it in order to demonstrate that the, this record is historically sound and can be confirmed. And I'll leave the details to him to iron out. Uh, when he presented his first paper, it had a couple of flaws in it <laughs> that he himself discovered. No one pointed out to him. He found the flaws, and he's trying to redo those and, and get that done. So keep your eye out. Uh, I don't know where he's going to publish it, but I've suggested to him that uh, when he publishes it, he makes certain that everyone knows about it, and he sends me drafts from time to time. So I'm looking forward to that. Yes? One of the other interesting things to me that, that stands out about this whole, what was happening for the division of Peleg is that when you look at the genealogy in Chapter 11, and as a, with a data, data analysis background, that discontinuity of the age lengths of dropping from 400 down to 200, you know, in one generation, if that is just in one generation, which it seems mm -hmm. to be because in, the, in Chapter 10 it says, it seems to be more specific that this is the son of. Mm -hmm. But that, that that's, I was trying to reconcile that, because initially when you look at, at chapter 11, you think, okay, maybe that's where there's a gap in the genealogy, because it's such a nice steady decline and then a right. big drop, and then a, mm -hmm. that's another nice steady decline. But then looking at chapter 10, it says, no, he's this more specifically that it's the direct descendant. Right, and it's hard to put in any extended genealogy here in chapter 10 or 11. Uh, you really have to go to the Book of Chronicles and Exodus before we get into that issue and that problem. And it's really more related to uh, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Levi. And that's where Dr. John Whitcomb is building his case in uh, trying to demonstrate mm -hmm. that. Now, he's also trying to argue that if you have that in that later genealogy, it makes it more possible for gaps to be in the prior genealogies. The problem with that is you can say that, you can present it as a possibility, but to this point, there's no sound evidence to deal with. But one of the things that that brings into mind is I wonder if that plays in on what the actual division is. If there is such a big discontinuity in age, ages of people, would that point towards more of a catastrophic physical type thing that happened mm -hmm. of some sort? It could. Again, we have so little evidence, so little to work with, it's hard to say and hard to deal with it. It's something that uh, people could propose various models to deal with it. Uh, this model of um, uh, migrating peoples might even be tied to that uh, because you have to deal with, okay, is this migration caused by drought? Is it caused by earthquake? Is it caused by... Uh, political uprising? Is it caused by disease? What's the cause of these great migrations of the past? H why did they happen? Uh, why did they go the directions they went? Uh, did they go where they would have relief from drought or famine? I mean, we see patterns of that. We have Israel going to Egypt. In fact, not just Israel. The whole world comes to Egypt during the days of Joseph because of the famine. Uh, especially in the ancient Near East, the region around the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean especially. So we do see patterns like that. And of course, warfare and political instability creates also migra uh, migratory movements of peoples. But we also know through history that disease can do the same. Uh, tectonic activity, volcanic activity, all of these can produce those types of movements. So what are the causes? And some of those causes, uh, the volcanic activity is a very interesting one because volcanic activity, if it's major, can disrupt entire peoples. It can kill off entire peoples with the uh, uh, pyroclastic clouds coming off the volcanoes, the amount of ash that covers up farmland that then becomes unusable for years before it can be regained and repopulated. Very interesting to consider what may have occurred there. All right, so those are some of the things I would hope that you've come up with. 
on your uh, worksheets for this one problem in Genesis chapter 10. Uh, which one do I hold to? I personally believe that that top one, the dividing of the languages, is the primary one that must be considered. Uh, the very fact that the scattering of peoples, the verb used for scattering, and the verbs used for uh, identifying the divisions uh, work out to fit the story because those same verbs are used in the account of the dividing of the languages at the Tower of Babel. Uh, First Chronicles 119 is one of those places that you uh, go to in seeing this. In First Chronicles 119, turning there in my text. We have, uh, and to Aber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, because in his days the earth was divided. In other words, the chronicler picks up the exact same statement. It is significant enough that he brings it out. It's not just Moses pointing it out in Genesis chapter 10. Now, that's significant because of the fact that we have to understand why the chronicler wrote his book. Why were First and Second Chronicles written? Look at the characteristics of these books. Compare them with First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Look at David as an example. When David is described in Chronicles, his sin with Bathsheba is not even mentioned. His murder of Uriah is not mentioned. It's glossed over. You look at Solomon and his apostasy because of his many wives and drawing his heart away in 1 Kings 11 is not mentioned. Chronicles doesn't even give a complete genealogy of all the tribes of Israel. It focuses on two, Judah and the Levites. It becomes very obvious then that the purpose of the chronicler is more theological than historical. His focus is upon, first of all, the priesthood and perhaps being written by a priest and dealing with what the priesthood is to accomplish being mediators between God and man, being those who preserve and pass on the written revelation that God gives to man. And then the line of Judah is because of the Davidic dynasty and the Davidic covenants, the Davidic covenant that is important. So that even when you come down to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, you have a prayer of David, which is the pattern for the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. He is using phraseology taken directly from David's prayer. This is the greater son of David praying the prayer of David as a lesson to his disciples. So as we think about that and we see the purpose of the book of Chronicles, then we understand that then there's got to be, for him to include this statement about Peleg, there's got to be a reason for including it. It's got to be, as we look at the list here, irrigation doesn't stand up to the test. Continental drift doesn't stand up to the test. Earthquake doesn't stand up to the test. Dividing of nations might. A major political rift? No. Division into Abrahamic and Arabic lines, some have proposed that on the basis of the mention in Chronicles. But that just doesn't seem to pan out either because not all the line of Shem that's being talked about. So we're left with two possible, dividing of nations, divided of languages. Those are perfectly tied together because the peoples who speak the same language are going to gather together in community groups forming their own nations or their own cities or city-states. Why would that be mentioned? To highlight that there's one people, one nation, chosen by God to fulfill his program of redemption. One nation through whom he has appointed a priesthood. This goes all the way back to, doesn't it? It goes to Exodus chapter 19 where Israel is a kingdom of priests. So as we look at that, 
I think that this helps us to see that the right reason for mentioning Peleg is the significance he bears to the fact that he's the line of Shem, but it's also a time of dividing the world into languages and nations out of which will come the line of Abraham, out of which will come Israel, out of which will come the Messiah of the line of David. And that, I think, helps to contribute to the viewpoint that we see here in Genesis chapter 10, one of those two options. Peleg, the name itself, is from the verb palag, which means to divide. That's just an eponymous, it's just taking a situation, an event, and applying it to the name of the individual. That same word is translated as streams of water, which is why we get the irrigation and the water courses. Uh, Job in Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, and Lamentations, where we have a noun used in that way, Peleg. The divided channels in Job 38.25, which is in the sea. But Psalm 55.10, I take to be the key text, because here we have it specifically to divide their tongues, and it's Peleg that's used, tying it back to this. Why do I find this especially fascinating? Who wrote Psalm 55? David. Why does David write Psalm 55? It's that psalm where he says, oh, if I had the wings of a dove, I'd fly far away from Jerusalem because of its violence, its wickedness, and the iniquity within its walls. I would fly away to the wilderness where I could dwell in quiet and peace. He's dealing with conflict. He's dealing with opposition. He's dealing with the sinfulness of the people. And there's political intrigue. There's immorality. There's all these things that are at play. The same type of thing that we see at play in dividing nations and peoples, not only with the flood, but following the flood, and now the dividing of languages and peoples. It fits that time. The conflict arises out of this because this is where we get the specific and individual identities of national groupings and languages that become so important. You can't have uh, a nation of Israel without there being national identity, without there being the concept of statehood, without there being a unifying uh, element in some way, like language, that binds the people together. And so this all plays in well to the overall picture, and I would add that to the argument for taking it as a reference here. The earth being divided in the days of Peleg is referring to the dividing of languages, and then because of languages, into nations. So I take both of those as being interrelated. The word scattered, the word puts, is found in Genesis 10 and 11. And some point at that and say, well, but that's what talks about their scattering. But we're talking about the dividing of languages, primarily, first of all. Now, look at the table of nations here. This is one man's map to demonstrate where all the peoples are. Notice we have the Elamites up there in the upper right along with the Medes and Persians. We know that Elam is in the line. We have the Sumerians, not mentioned specifically. Babylonians, mentioned through Babel, mentioned through Nimrod. We have the Akkadians, not mentioned by name in the list we have here, but it's a people related to those around Nimrod. The Assyrians, Asher, the Hurrians, the Urartians, the Hittites, the Chimerians, the Phrygians, Cilicians, Lydians. Are, is that the area of Lud? Or is the area of Lud tied to Libya in North Africa and Morocco? We have the Arameans, that's Aram. The Phoenicians, the Ammonites, Amorites, Moabites, Edomites. Some of these are minor peoples rather than being major, and they come much later. The Ammonites and Moabites aren't part of Genesis 10, 12. They're part of Genesis 18 and 19. 
they're descendants of Lot and his two daughters. So they're not part of the table here. But they arise out of the line of Shem. The Midianites, yeah, we have Midian mentioned. The Dedanites, yes. Egyptians, Mitzrayim, yes. We have a lot mentioned here. The Greeks, Yavan, Yawan. That's the same root word that we get Ionian from. Ionian Greek is Yawan, J-A-V-A-N or J-A-W-A-N. The Greeks are clearly represented here. And uh, outstanding in the way that they're focused on here. So we involved in more than just the ancient Near East when you get as far as Yawan. And a lot of the other names will go out beyond there as well. In fact, the Chimerians here, uh, some talk about those perhaps being one form of Gomer. And that is argued and debated. And that's why when Cooper deals with this, he works in the line of Japheth to try to demonstrate some of these lines. But by doing that, he's also isolated some peoples in Europe that don't tie to Japheth that are intruders from other regions or areas that are found in Europe in later history, but are descendants of other sons of Noah other than Japheth. I would offer to you that this map and this listing is obviously, first of all, incomplete because there are a lot of names that we have in the list here that aren't on here and obviously are just trying to demonstrate that this is mainly the ancient Near East without showing how far from this center we go in the table. And this is what next week I want to get into. I want to ask a, one of the questions I want to deal with at least a little bit. And a couple of years ago when I taught this course, I challenged some of the Chinese students in the class to do a study of where the Chinese might be referred to in the Old Testament and what line of Noah they come through. That's fascinating. Here's another, the nations of Genesis 10, this is labeled from the Atlas. Notice Gomer, Tagarma, Lud, Yawan. Uh, notice there it says Greeks, although Greek is off the map. Ashkenaz, the Scythians, Asher, Assyria, Madai, the, um, uh, the Medes, Elam, Persia, Arfaxad, over there in the region of Ur of the Chaldees. I refer you to my uh, article on Genesis chapter 11, verses 36 and 39 in the Master's Summary Journal a few years back, where I dealt with the uh, identification of the Chaldeans and how that the very title Chaldeans may very well be part of, they may be sense of Arfaxad. That's one of the possible ties. And this map has put them in that way. Joktan only being part of all the descents listed for the Arabians. The Philistines, the Canaanites, the Amorites, Mitzrayim, Egypt, and Put being in Libya. And Lud in uh, Turkey or Asia Minor. Lud could also be put in North Africa, according to some. And there are some who identify Put as not only being located in North Africa, but also located in Arabia. So interesting ones. The blue here represents descendants of Shem, the green descendants of Ham, and the red descendants of uh, Japheth. Notice how the Medes are descendants of Japheth. Some have said that's why they tend to be what? The original Medes were blonde, blue-eyed, white-skinned. Fascinating. Very interesting to see that. And again, I'll point out that when you look at the history of peoples and the types of Homo sapiens, the development of the races as we talk about it, the variation occurs in each of the three lines, the least variation in the line of Japheth. But the line of Japheth tends to remain in temperate climates wherever they went. And that seems to have an impact upon the lack of further genetic development in changes and in uh, ad adaptations that take place in the genetic varieties. 
I think that's an area that needs to have a lot more study itself. I think those, we have a number of uh, creation scientists who are geneticists who have begun working on some of this but haven't yet resolved all the issues that are involved. In fact, they've been more interested in trying to demonstrate everyone's from descendants of Adam and Eve and what they keep running up against is we had a flood in there. <laughs> and so the one couple everyone goes back to is not Adam and Eve, first of all, but to Noah and his wife. And how can you demonstrate prior to that? You can't. And so they've had difficulties with that issue and have had to rewrite some of their earlier articles and arguments saying that, you know, it shows one mother, but now the geneticists are saying, wait a minute, there's way too much variety. And if you can take it back to Noah, you have that variety inherent in the genetics of the descendants of Noah. That is the fascinating point, and that's what applies most to what we're talking about. Let me stop here and see if you have any questions. We have only three minutes left. Rather than jumping into chapter 11, I'll reserve that for next week. Uh, there's so much to cover there, um, and I want to wrap it up and tie it up the way we were talking earlier. Chaz? Kind of translation question. Yes. <laughs> Make it a heading? Yeah, make it a heading. Yes, I would. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The Toledot formula effectively divides up the text of Genesis. And it's interesting. That same Toledot formula occurs elsewhere in the Bible, including Chronicles and including Matthew. Although not Toledot there, it's in Greek. All right. All right. Anything else before we go? Yes, Sam? Yes. Can we draw any gospel significance from that um, regarding the descendants of Jacob um, being blessed by the Messiah, or is that talking about something else? No, I think that because of the way this is placed in Genesis and because of the uh, significance of this prophetic announcement, the blessing and how it ties in the history of Abraham and following, that we have to say there is spiritual significance here that Japheth to receive blessing must receive it from Shem, which is the same then later saying through Abraham. It's saying that uh, Japheth is outside the redemptive uh, line of descent that God has chosen to work through. And so therefore they must look for everything to get in Shem. Notice the same thing is basically said about Ham because he's to be a servant Canaan is to be a servant, and uh, uh, we're told that, uh, excuse me here, Canaan is a servant to him. Uh, some take this as being a uh, servant to uh, Shem, because we're talking about the God of Shem. And so both of these are very dependent, heavily dependent upon Shem. And so I think, yes, there's spiritual significance to it. And of course, ultimately, that's what I think we have in Acts 8, 9, and 10. 